So hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Hello. Uh, my name is Lucy, Lucy Kadena, and I'm going to be your trainer for today's webinar, which is called Going Big. So it's all about recruitment and outreach and making sure that your event, your Climate Strikes event, is as big and powerful as it can be. So this is one of a series of three webinars that we're running. Um, so many of you may already have been on some of the other webinars. So there's escalation and goals and strategy are the other two topics that we're running. And these are gonna be running on a rolling basis all the way up to the climate strikes in the end of September. So there's plenty of opportunities to join those other, um, those other trainings as well. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Lucy, I use the pronouns she and her. I'm based in Budapest, um, which is where I live but I'm from the UK and uh, I first got active in climate change activism when I was a youth activist with the UK Youth Climate Coalition in the UK and then again with Young Friends of the Earth and since then I've worked for Friends of the Earth International and for 350 Now and so this topic is very close to my heart because I'm all about youth activism and school strikes are really kind of inspiring for me. So you'll notice that you are on mute at the moment, which is why we've asked you to type your introductions into the chat box, um, which might be this way, it might be that way. Um, so thank you to those of you who've already done that. So hi again, Rachel. Hello again, Eric. Um, hi again, Gia. Um, nice to see you all and just keep typing in your introductions into that chat box. Um, make sure that you have set um, your chat box to say uh, to all panelists and attendees, which is something that I had forgotten to say. So there's a little, there's a little drop down menu there in the bit where you type in your message and it's in blue and just make sure it says all panelists and, and attendees. And I forgot to do that earlier. I sent you all a little little message, but it didn't go to any of you. Because <clears throat> if, um, if it's to all panelists, it just means it just goes to kind of me and the tech person, and that's not really much use. So, um, so hello everybody. Hello again, Yoko. Hello, Zoe. Um, hello, Zar. Um, and yeah, good to see you all again. And um, so I'll take you through some of the controls again that we're going to be using. So there's the chat box. You can use this at any point. It's really the most frequently used tool that we have. Um, and you can use it to, part, you know, to communicate with me, to communicate with other people. Um, another tool that we're going to use uh, is the Q&A box. Um, so question and answer box. And we use this most kind of at the end in the Q&A session, but you can also type questions in there at any point during uh, this webinar. We'll try and uh, we'll try and answer them live if we can, um, but if not, we'll come back to it at the Q&A. Um, there's also raise hand. So there are times in this webinar when I'll say to you, uh, does somebody want to share on the microphone your experience or your idea or anything like that and I'll invite you to raise your hand and then I can take you off mute and you can speak into your microphone. There's also we're going to have another poll during this webinar um, and if you're joining uh, on voice call via your phone then I'm afraid you won't be able to participate but I'll run you through it. So um, I'm going to introduce our tech person today which is uh, Nona again. Say hello Nona. Oh, I think you're on mute, Nana. I was on mute. Um, uh, I think I've been on a webinar with some of you already. I'm just here if you have any questions um, and to help you sort out any tech difficulties that you may have. Thanks very much, Nana. So you can use uh, the chat box to chat with Nana. Um, you can actually um, select on that drop down menu again, you can select tech help Nana and that will send a private message to her. Um, so just to let you know, we are recording this session. 
um, and that's for training purposes, but also for you to watch back if you've if you've missed anything. Um, so a big hello to everybody, and let's get started. So, what you'll need for this workshop: make sure that you have a pen and paper handy during this workshop. Um, you may also need a calculator, so I hope that doesn't stress any anyone out. But there's going to be a little bit of maths in this uh, in this webinar. Um, but if you don't have a calculator, you know, your phone will probably have a calculator or your computer or Google can help you out. Or you might be able to do sums in your head, which is something that I can't do. So I'd be very impressed. Uh, so the objectives of this webinar. So hopefully by the end of this webinar, we're going to have a better understanding about movement building and reaching beyond our bubble. And we want to have identified the most important groups and people to reach out to. So you might have something at the end of the webinar that looks a bit like this on your piece of paper. So this webinar, again, is designed to be interactive. So we invite you to take responsibility for your own learning, engage with the questions, engage with the exercises as much as you can. So the agenda for today, we're going to talk about achieving this kind of tipping point like how big do we need to go how many people do we need to mobilize um, we're going to talk about building active support and then we're going to go on to recruiting from outside our circles we're going to talk about roles and responsibilities and then the next kind of course of action and then of course resources and question time so kicking off our training again with a poll so again, if you're on the phone, if you're joining by voicemail, you won't be able to, by a voice call, I always say voicemail, by a voice call, you won't be able to see this. But if you're on your computer, this would have popped up for you. And again, we're asking, you know, is this your first time taking action? Are you a regular activist? Have you participated before? Um, and also, are you connected up? Is there a local climate action group that you're part of? Uh, is there a group that you're not a part of but or is there one you know is it that you want to create your own group or do you not want to be part of a group um, so just a few more seconds for you to kind of fill that out and I can see I can see these responses coming in and you can't which is quite exciting but I'll share the results with you okay five more seconds three two, one. Okay. So looks like most people on this call are complete newbies. So you're completely new. This is going to be your first time taking action. And this makes me very, very excited and very warm welcome to you. Um, and we've got a couple of regular activists. We've got most people here involved in a local climate action group. Oh, sorry, like 50%. Um, and most other people know that there's a group locally, but not yet involved. So, um, so maybe after this webinar, you will kind of reach out to them and get involved. Cool. Thanks for helping me out with that. So um, I'm going to start by asking you a question. 3.5% of the population. Has anybody heard of the 3.5% rule before? I'm very curious. If you have heard them, raise your hand and tell me what it is. You can also type in the chat if you're feeling a little bit shy. Hmm. Simon, okay. Would you like to unmute yourself and let us know what's the 3.5% rule? Or what do you think it is? You might need to click unmute. Okay. Hello, Simon. Hello, Lucy. Hi. Uh, hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Do you know what the 3.5% rule is? Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you going to have a guess? Uh, well, if, if I have to have a guess, it's like you have the 3.5 people that are actually living in uh, countries that actually are polluting and uh, causing climate change. And then you have the bigger number who are actually more, who will be affected more by climate change. That would be my guess. 
Ah, that's a really good guess. It's not quite what we're looking for, but it's a really good guess because obviously there's only a small percent of the population who's responsible for the most amount of climate change. So it's a good guess, but it's not the one we're looking for. So I'm going to explain now what the 3.5% rule is, but thank you, Simon. <laughs> so the 3.5% rule. Uh, so this is, um, this is something that uh, a professor called Erica Chenoweth came up with, okay? And what it means is that it takes around 3.5% of the population actively participating in nonviolent civil disobedience to ensure serious political change, right? So this is from a study conducted by this political scientist, Erica Chenoweth from Harvard University. And she conducted a study of the top 300 social movements and campaigns from the 20th century. And she, you know, uh, collected so much data on this and she found that there was an 100% success rate for those campaigns that had the active popular support of 3.5% of the population, right? So yeah, it's, it's actually really incredible, really motivating. I would very much recommend you watch her TED talk on it because it's really illuminating actually. Um, because I, you know, I would have thought it would be a much bigger percentage, but it's, it's not really. So we can consider 3.5% to be kind of a tipping point for social movements. It's the point at which the balance of power shifts in our favor. So active and sustained participation. Oh, I forgot. Sorry, this has gone on to a link. So active and sustained participation. What does that mean? So in other words, active popular support. So when I first heard this, I thought that it meant we need 3.5% of the population in the street on one big march, marching at the same time. And whereas that is a truly admirable, admirable goal, uh, it's not quite accurate. So the key word here is active. It means that those 3.5% are taking action, right? Amazing, Rachel, thank you for finding that. So everybody after this webinar, you should watch this TED talk, right? So what does local action, what does, what does active mean? So active can mean showing up. Yeah, it can mean showing up for rallies, marches, phone banking, door knocking, strikes, for example, it can mean that. It can also mean voting with the movement, right? It can also mean persuading others at school, family reunions, at work, online. And also it can mean acting independently within your own sphere of influence. So for example, teachers using their classrooms, right? Union members making resolutions in their union. This is all active participation. So believe it or not, over half of the world's population is concerned about climate change. This may vary from country to country, but the number of active deniers is actually now very small in most countries. So over 51% of people globally care and are concerned about climate change. And this is quite significant because what it means is the time for awareness raising is largely over, right? Yes, publicity will help us to create a new norm and move us towards our goals. Yes, education is very important, but what we really need now at this moment in time is active participation. So I, uh, I have, I, I promised you that there would be a maths test here, right? Um, so this is your maths test. I want you to, know, to find out how many is 3.5% in your country. So hopefully most of us have kind of a rough idea of the population of our own country. And your task now is to do this calculation and write it into the chat, okay? I'm gonna do my own as well.
So Zoe says that's 770,000 people in Australia. Is that right? 770,000? Yep. So 3.5 million in the Philippines, 2.1 million people for Rachel, uh, 9.24 million people in Indonesia, 2.8 million people in Germany. Well, I'm beginning to realize how small Hungary actually is. <laughs> 2.1 million in Italy, 525,000 in Rwanda. Okay, so the next question is, how does that number make you feel? Okay, and be honest, is it bigger or smaller than you expected? Is it overwhelming, hopeful, surprising, achievable? 300,000 in Israel, bigger than expected. Rachel, you think overwhelmingly achievable. I like your, I like your enthusiasm. Yeah, it's big. So a mix of feelings here, right? Yeah, it feels kind of overwhelming for some people. For some people, you know, 3.5 sounds like a tiny number and then you put it into that kind of calculation and it's actually quite an impressive number, right? So don't worry if it feels a little bit overwhelming because we're gonna break it down a little bit in the next slides. So in our goals and strategy webinar, which some of you may have joined yesterday or before, we talk about how we can better approach local action by viewing our local community as many different social groups and networks brought together by an intersection of geography, work, education, shared interests or shared identity. So in that sense, we're actually all a part of many, many local communities, right? So your task now is to choose just one community that you are a part of and to write it on your sheet of paper. So that could be your faith community, it could be your school, university, your workplace, um, a kind of shared interest community. So just write down one, okay. Okay. So next maths test, right, is asking how many is 3.5% of your chosen community? So you might have, you might need to estimate the number of people in your community. So for example, if your school has 300 students, then that would mean that you need 10 people. Or if I estimate in my apartment building, there's probably about 50 people. So uh, that would mean like one or two people. So try and estimate what is your community, what is 3.5% of that community, and type it into the chat. Okay, Simon says 15,000. So I'm interested to hear what's your, what's your community, Simon? And Yoko, what's your community? <clears throat> so 15,000, we've got four people, we've got 49 people, it's very precise. So Eric, what's your community there? So Zoe, your clients, so 3.5% is about four. Okay, Eric, so that's your locality, okay. And that's quite a nice one to do as well because usually we can have a bit more of a clear picture of the numbers. School of 20 teachers and staff and 100 parents. Oh, okay. So thanks, Yoko. Football team, one person, okay. Okay. So we all kind of have done this for sort of just one of the communities that we're part of, right? So I'm gonna pose that question again. How does that number make you feel? Achievable, right? <clears throat> 700, maybe Facebook group, that could count. I think that's a community, right? It is very achievable, okay? So it's a lot more achievable than that kind of big, uh, yeah, already, already achieved even, okay. So it doesn't mean that that's the total number of people that you need to recruit, right? Okay, 
all it means is that if you can encourage that number of people to join you from that community in actively supporting the climate strikes, that's the tipping point that will likely cause others in that group to take up your cause. But more importantly, if you can do that for every community that you're a part of, and if we all can have at least 3.5%, because that's an achievable number, then we can actually start to see momentum building and to affect real change. So I like your thinking, Yoko, it should be a domino. So four people ask other people from different communities. I think you're way ahead of us actually, because we're going to talk about something a bit like that. So we're going to look in a little bit more detail about how we can identify potential supporters and talk about building active support, right? So many of you may be familiar with the spectrum of allies. Some of you may not be familiar with it because I wasn't before I did an activist training. Um, so here's a little explanation. So often when we start out trying to mobilize, we kind of identify our audience or target group as the general public. And you'd not believe how, how many sort of experienced campaigners and activists identify their target audience as the general public, right? Because this, this can be kind of unhelpful because it's quite, it's quite vague. And by trying to reach everybody in the same way, by trying to get everyone to engage in the same way, we might actually end up not really reaching anybody. So one way of being more strategic here is to break down the general public into these kind of categories. So from left to right, we have active supporters, we have passive supporters, then we have neutral, passive opposition, and then active opposition. So the idea here is that one goal in movement building is to move people in each category one step towards the left. So passive opposition becomes neutral, neutral becomes passive support and so on. So my question now is in the chat, can you give me any examples of active supporters of the climate strikes, either locally, nationally or globally? So they might be an individual, an organization, or an institution, or a community, but these are the people who are actively already part of the movement mobilizing for the climate strikes. So who are our active supporters? Greta Thunberg, of course, yes. Who we hear has arrived safely in New York, yay. So she's definitely an active supporter. She's, yeah. Those listed in the partners list are active supporters. Absolutely. So all of those organizations that you can see in the Global Climate Strikes website, um, they're all active supporters. So NGO leaders. So Eric, in your local area, it's the Rwanda Environmental Organization, Global Greens, Fridays for Future. I think we've got this. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that you might agree that these are really these kind of people, Extinction Rebellion, yeah. Elon Musk, maybe globally. Yeah, I mean, maybe Bob Brown. So yeah, so these are these are people who we know are already involved. They're already involved in the climate fight. These people are not our biggest target for the climate strikes. They're already involved. OK, so you don't have to persuade them. We don't have to do any work there. It's those passive supporters that we have our eyes on that we need to be targeting. We need to put our efforts into moving these people from passive to active supporters. So passive supporters are those who are concerned about climate change, but so far they haven't done anything active about it, right? So for example, my friend Thea, for example, is a passive supporter. She often posts about climate related articles on social media. I know that she's concerned. I also know that she's never taken action, right? So another question, can you think of an example of a passive supporter that you know in your network? And again, either it's an individual or a group or an organization, which you can type into the chat. This might be slightly harder to identify. Yoko, you think you're still a passive supporter? 
you've never been in a strike, but remember that active, when we say active, it means different things. You're here on this training. So I'm afraid, I think that you've already passed over the threshold into being an active supporter. Most university students, yeah, most, most educated people are concerned about climate change, right? Most people in education who are seeing like, you know, these statistics and things all the time who are surrounded by, you know, other concerned people, they're going to be passive supporters. People who like climate change friendly posts, most of my friends are passive supporters. Yeah, my, most of my friends too actually are passive supporters. It's quite, it's quite frustrating sometimes, but they are, yeah. Some members of parliament, right? Okay, so we've got it. So, so if we're organizing with another tactic, so for example, if we were, um, if we were using educational awareness raising, right, then our aim there would probably be, we'd probably be doing that because we want to encourage neutral people to become passive supporters, right? But that's not our tactic, that's not our strategy. We're organizing disruptive action. And for that to work, we need active popular support, right? So remember the key word in that 3.5% rule is active participation. And also remember that over half of the world's population is concerned about climate change. So if we really think about it in that way, our passive supporter base is actually huge. It may not be as big as half in some countries, but it's still a pretty big percentage. So it's very clear then that now in 2019, our task is to activate those people, to turn them into active supporters. So now I have a couple of questions for you. I'm gonna give you maybe two minutes to list the active supporters and the passive supporters of the, of the climate strikes in your local area. So these might be communities that you're a part of or that you know about. And the two minutes start now. So again, these might be individuals, grassroots groups, organizations, institutions. So please list them on your piece of paper. And just to give you an example, just so that you can see uh, maybe some inspiration. I've done my own. Uh, here's one I did earlier. So I've listed my act, the active supporters that I know about. And then I've kind of thought it's a little bit harder and, and and gone for my passive supporters in my local area as well. Again, if you do finish early, then do feel free to share into the chat. But this is really, you know, an exercise for you to do yourself. <clears throat> okay so hopefully by now you probably have an idea of the active supporters right uh, and maybe you have a bit more a few passive supporters okay So hopefully you have those now. Let me know if you do need more time. So now I'd like you to look again at your list and now like push yourself a little bit more. Who is missing? Because we need to take a minute and question, are we making assumptions about who is and is not a supporter of climate justice? And where do those assumptions come from? Do we need to test them? It's likely that we're going to think first about those people within our own demographic or our own communities or our own social bubble, right? But it's important that we also consider diversity in class, race, age, gender, profession, and more. So thinking along those lines, you might be able to add some potential passive supporters to your list. So I want you to just take a moment now and see if you can add three groups to your list. And I'm going to give you my example here as well. 
So I had my active supporters, my passive supporters, and I noticed that these are people who are already in my bubble, right? So I started to look outside my bubble, okay? And think about maybe Migrants Help Association in Hungary, you know, the Budapest Bike Mafia, which I know is a social justice group, the kind of radical and church faith organizations that I'm not part of, but, but I know are really powerful here in Hungary. So hopefully you're thinking you're able, you're able to add maybe three other organizations to your list. And if you would like to share them, please do. Ah, so Simon said, Catholic bishops are active supporters while we have church members that might be passive. Yeah, that's true. So Simon, could you, yeah, as Nona says, if you're, if you're typing into the chat, remember to type to all panelists and all attendees. Yeah. So Eric, are those, um, those people you listed, are they active or are they passive? Because I think the Pope is pretty active actually on climate change. Maybe that's what you mean. So Eric, yeah, the missing people are BP Exxon Mobile um, and CEOs. So I think that we would put those in our active opposition category. And it's kind of widely kind of accepted that we don't really bother with them unless, you know, the only real way to move them from an active opposition to maybe a passive opposition is usually through legal means, right? Through suing them, that kind of thing. That's not really something that we can do with this kind of climate strike tactic. Okay, reaching student circles through our student children. Yeah. Active Masters of Strategic Leadership Awards um, towards, sorry, towards sustainability alumni. Passive people who believe in science. Yeah, my family. Ah, that's a good one. So, so Simon said, poor farmers that depend on fertilizer subsidies are passive, or those that are practicing organic agriculture are active. And that can change, right? Okay. So, okay, great. So I think that, that this is that you're getting the idea here. So to summarize, your passive supporters, these are our target to mobilize. So we're going to get them involved, right? So when it comes to recruitment, many of us kind of visualize people as individuals. We think that there's kind of a scattering of individual people out there that we need to recruit. So that's what you're seeing here on the left. But the reality really is different. As we've already talked about, we're all part of many different local communities. And social circles may be organized as formal or informal groups like the communities we listed earlier. <laughs> And actually, one of the main reasons a person will join a group or get involved in any kind of activity is usually because someone they know has personally invited them. So the quickest way to recruit people is to ask people in your own communities. So your friends and your family. So these are the people most likely to say yes to you. But a group stops growing when it reaches its sort of maximum potential of people from its members initial social circle. So if we continue to reach out within that circle, it may not bring in many more people. So this means that your, your group has a maximum limit. So instead of that, the trick is really to look outside of our social circles to find people who are connected with other circles. So applying this to our spectrum of allies exercise earlier, you're going to be reaching out and finding those people in other circles who might be passive supporters right now, or finding groups of people who are passive supporters. So this means our priority is reaching out to people who are outside of our own circles who are different from us, which might feel uncomfortable sometimes, but this requires stepping outside of our comfort zones. So this way, you can actually end up involving many different groups and communities and you don't have to do all the work of recruiting every single person in each group. And there are a few different ways of doing this and mostly they're about 
connecting and talking to people. So it's about kind of showing up at the events and meetings of people outside of your circle. And this is a great chance to meet others, to see how they work, to find out where their values overlap with your campaign. Another way, and this is what we talk about in the Escalation webinar, is to diversify the roles and risk levels in your event. So if you're asking everybody to do the same thing and it's not working, then it's time to adapt. Also notice when other groups show interest in your movement and follow up with them. So the really simple but highly effective way of getting new people on board is talking to them and specifically by giving them your one-on-one -on -one attention. So the key people that you're identifying by inviting them to have a one-on-one. -on -one. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that now, what it's like to build a meaningful relationship and how that can help us to build the power of our movement. So um, apologies for the slightly creepy graphic, I didn't choose it. <laughs> but, um, but this is to demonstrate having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody in this kind of funny hand gesture way. So reach out to leaders from other movements and groups and meet with different people, not just to recruit them, right? But to learn from them. What are their values? What interests them? What strategies recruit people like them? So the four C's is a kind of simple concept to give an effective structure to your discussions with these people. The idea is that you find 30 minutes to sit down and meet with a person. So first you connect on personal things, you find out how they are, and then you give the context. So you say, listen, I'm working on this thing, the global climate strike, let them know the context, what we want to achieve, articulate your goals that maybe if you've done the goals and strategy training, let them know what, what are your goals. Then you need to give them a legitimate choice, okay? You need to, you need to tell them what I'd like you to do is this, yes or no, okay? And give them the opportunity to say yes or no. And then you confirm the commitment and this is where you give the sort of next steps, you give the details. So this, this is obviously incredibly simple. It might even seem intuitive to many people, but it is a really effective step-by-step -step process. We also want to sort of flag that a definite no is actually better than a maybe yes. And the idea here is that if someone seems really half-hearted, you should offer the, them the opportunity to say no rather than keep pushing if they're, if they're not really into it. We want to find people who can commit now and then we can come back to these other people later right so this is a better strategy than just kind of like keep pushing and pushing and pushing someone you want a team of really committed enthusiastic people and also a note here when we're reaching out to activists from marginalized communities we need to remember that we may have identified them as a passive supporter of the climate strikes but they're actually active supporters of other causes right and they may have been part of a movement for a long time, often taking radical action in very difficult circumstances. So we're approaching these people from a place of mutual learning and respect. It's not just about making space for them in our movement, actually. If they say no this time, that's okay. Remember, we're trying to build long-term alliances, not just for this climate strike. So, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes for this question again. Now, thinking about what we've talked about so far, about the passive supporters that we've identified, the communities that we've identified, I want you to write down uh, on your sheet of paper, write down on your sheet of paper, who are going to be your next three one-on-ones. So which individuals or maybe which organizations that you want to find somebody to talk with from who are going to be your next three one-on-ones? I'll give you a bit of time to think about that. And if you finish early again, you can type in the chat or raise your hand. Okay, Eric, would you like to come off mute and tell us who are your three people? 
Nona, could you unmute Eric? Oh, yeah. Yes. Hi, Eric. Uh, uh, hi, uh, Lucy and the other attendees. I want to talk to the reader of the community so that you can mobilize the, or the population and uh, introduce the poor for those who want to join and those who don't want. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Great. Thank you, Eric. So you're going to talk to like the leader of the community so that I think that's, yeah, yeah that's a, that's a great person to identify. I think someone yeah. who's got quite a big amount of reach, maybe a lot of influence. Yeah, because in our community, it's uh, a bit decentralized. Yeah. So yeah, it moves uh, up, down, like. Okay. Russia, that's it. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. So yeah, so so I think that Eric's got the right idea. So we're looking for people who maybe you know, uh, who might be a leader within that community. We're going to talk about leaders in a minute, actually. Um, and leadership structures, um, but that you might be able to identify like a key person within that community who might be the best person. Zoe, do you want to come off mute? Uh, Nonna, could you take Zoe off mute? Thank you. Hi, Zoe. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, so um, the person that I've thought of is, is We've got a local community Facebook page, which is mm -hmm. just everything to do, to do with the suburb where I live. Um, I was thinking of talking to the admin of that community ah. um, so that then he can mobil help mobilise the whole of the Facebook community in the I local area. I think that's a great idea. So this is, this is kind of like a, 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 a Facebook community for like, for local people, right? Yeah, yeah. So it just, um, yeah, it's a Facebook group, yeah, um, okay. but just for our local, you know, I don't know, mile or something like that. I think that's a fab idea. I think mm. definitely, I, I know that like, you know, we're talking about face-to-face one-on-ones, but we know that also, you know, the digital world overlaps so much with, you know, the real world, obviously. Mm. Mm. And, and actually like these Facebook groups, especially if it's a Facebook group that is, that is active, um, that is locally kind of centered, um, yeah. and also can put on events and things like that, I think it's a really great idea. Mm. Cool, thank you, Zoe. No worries. And I think we had, is it Gia who had um, your hand raised? Do you want to share as well, Gia? You might need to unmute yourself. Um, hi. Yeah. My city, Baguio City in, in the Philippines, is very, very aware of uh, climate change and environment uh, disasters because we are a very disaster-prone area with, with the frequency of our storms and rains. Yeah. Um, right now, we have many groups. Even our schools are very aware about uh, about uh, activities on climate change and ecology. So we are now thinking of talking to our city council. Okay. Okay. And uh, yes, and since we have a new mayor after thirty years, could you imagine? Uh, and he is very open to listening to new uh, ideas. We are aiming to talk to him about the coming uh, climate strike. That's fantastic. That's really great news that you have a new mayor that's actually a receptive and open kind of person. So I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah, so I think I think you're right. When when we talk about you know um, the kind of number of passive supporters or active supporters globally, it's very different from country to country, right? And so we're like the Philippines that just has been facing typhoon after typhoon with increasing intensity. People are more than aware that climate change is real, right? So I think this is I think that's a really great idea, yeah, to 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 reach out to this this new mayor. And start that relationship now because it might be a fruitful one for the future as well. Cool. Yes, it it comes in timely. So yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. 
so thank you for sharing your your one-on-ones and i really i really hope that you do carry out those one-on-ones and simon says i'll target the community leaders of those living in areas affected by the smoke that comes from the coal power plant good idea i think yeah because these people will know these effects better than anybody so in order to build and grow then so many movements um look at this kind of swarm theory of structuring a social movement and i wonder if nona if you would be able to paste in there's a, a link in the agenda that i wonder if you could paste into the chat because we're not going to have time really to go into this in detail but i want to make sure that you're able to get to the resources that you need um so this is um this is from the kind of momentum trainings this idea of the swarm theory of movement and it's about structuring your movement in a way that maximizes the autonomy and creativity of its members so making sure that you know the key principle with any mobilization moment or tactic is we're not trying to make everybody do the same thing everybody say the same thing it's far too prescriptive and just isn't the way to include or empower people because we're trying to build a movement where people are able to be creative and autonomous to use their own unique skills, their unique power and experiences to strength, strengthen and diversify our movement. And in order to build and grow, many movements look to the snowflake leadership model, right? So in, in some progressive circles, the word leadership is not a very welcome one, right? here we're not talking about having one great leader who we all follow it's about developing leaders who support each other and are accountable to their communities because no one person can do everything you're not going to be able to do everything here we need to have a strong movement and enable and empower leaders from all sorts of different communities and this is about sustaining the movement more than anything and making sure everybody is cared for and is healthy and can do this for the long run so the idea about having a role is that you know we've got sort of three basic rules to, in order to make this kind of movement work firstly everybody has a role and you have to hold your role and the idea is we don't have anybody telling you what to do you know your role and you know what needs to happen so secondly your role is flexible okay so if you can't do your role for any reason, it should be okay. We just need to make sure your role gets covered, that you can pass it on. And thirdly, roles are about support. So in our community, we say that support flows outwards. So the more leadership you have, the more support you're offering in the swarm. So now we're going to take our learnings from this training and we're going to put them into practice. So let's see so what we're asking is for you to kind of set a participation goal for your climate strikes event so we've looked at kind of you know the 3.5 percent we've looked at what that means in our different communities we want to be ambitious right so set that participation goal for your slight climate strikes event and then what we often do when we set a goal for participation is we then set the goal and then we double it right so we really challenge ourselves so how many people will you want to attend using the learnings from this webinar? How are you gonna get there? The second thing we'd like you to do is to reach out to those three one-on-one -on -one people that you, might have, that you might have identified, okay? And we want you to report back. So we have our Facebook group, which many of you are already a part of. Some of you may not be, so click on the link that Nona has just put into the chat that's the link to the Facebook group um, and just request to join and I'll approve you straight away after this webinar. And it's really a place for us to kind of support each other, to write these reflections um, and to share what's, what we're finding a challenge and maybe to get advice from each other. So thank you, Nona, for putting those two links in there. The, the link above is um, a YouTube video which is about this kind of idea of swarm, the swarm theory of movement building, if you're interested. So to make sure you have the support you need, here's some resources. So the first is the globalclimatestrike.net uh, website, um, which I think most of you are probably familiar with by this point. Um, 
but I'm going to draw attention again to the Climate Resistance Handbook because I really hope that some of you are downloading this and reading it as your bedtime story. So you can you can get to the handbook here. It's completely free. Uh, it's available as um, an ebook, as a PDF, which you can download. So so make sure that you download that because it's actually really uh, specifically. Um, uniquely kind of relevant to this moment now and the climate strikes. So um, again, some more resources are available for you at that trainings.350.org. And don't worry, we're going to send an email after this call where I'm going to put in all the all of these links so that you have them in one place. Um, it's going to be reminding you to register for the other topics in the series if you haven't already taken them. It's going to remind you of the Facebook link. Um, and so, so don't worry if you don't catch them now. Um, another resource is the M Momentum community, which has a lot of resources on movement building and how to grow your movement. So it's got a bunch of other webinars which have been recorded. So they've already been carried out. So you can watch them at any time you like, and it's all for free. So I'd really, really re recommend them. I think the Swarm videos are the ones which I would really recommend here. So after this webinar, there'll also be a, um, a survey that's going to pop up on your screen. It's optional, of course, but it's going to help us to monitor our progress in building a powerful, diverse movement. So you can indicate if you've already completed the webinar, uh, the survey, you don't have to do it twice. And of course, if you need any help, you can reach out in the Facebook group. You can also email me here at lucy.kadena at 350.org. And uh, if you can't remember that, then just help at 350.org. And you'll get through to Nona, who will forward your message on to me. So I wonder if we have any questions. We have a few minutes um, for some questions that you might have, you can either type them into the chat box or you can type them into the Q&A box or you can raise your hand and you can ask it live and I'll do my best to answer. Okay, so we have Eric first of all. Eric, would you like to unmute yourself? I wanted to ask a simple question. This movement is for the long term, right? Mm. Yeah, and and do we have supporters? So this movement is for the long term. Is that your question? You know, it's for the long term, and you have supporters. Those who support, like on the website, yeah. you find like donate section where people donate like things to mm. organize these webinars. Yeah, and I wanted to know the business like of those people who support us, and if like they really benefit from what we do like in the short term like in the market quarters like you give things like to get their profit how do they benefit from in the short term aha uh -huh. so i think that's a really good question so so um this this obviously these trainings they're designed to First of all, I think the priority is to set you up for this kind of short term for the climate strikes, because obviously I think that we all know that we want to be building a sustainable long term movement that's building momentum. Um, but we have kind of right on the horizon right now, we have a big mobilization moment. So it's kind of all hands on deck. Let's get let's get prepared for that. Right. However, uh, I know I know that like it's a it's a much longer process we're not gonna we're not gonna save the climate with this just one climate strike so yeah we are looking at the long term and actually after the climate strikes what we're going to be doing is we're going to also be holding um kind of pivoting webinars so so we're going to be helping to train you about kind of what's next how do we sustain those local movements that we've worked hard to build and how do we start developing sort of alliances that are going to work on the on the long term and how are we looking to sort of the next key moments right so that's that's kind of a long-term thing in terms of the supporters um so a lot of the people supporting on the website so um let me just 
let me just go to that. They're all, most of them are NGOs, so they're charities. So a lot of them are funded by donors. Um, so in terms of people sort of profiting from, from this movement, it's, it's, it's more about, you know, um, these, these, are, these are charitable organizations that run on donations, basically. I mean, the, I mean the, the vast majority of these, I can't see any that, that aren't. Some of them are membership organizations, so trade unions. So in general, none of them are gonna be profiting directly from, from what's happening. None of them are gonna be earning any income from this. It's what they do and, and that's, what they're, what, that's what they're funded to do. So thank you, thank you, Eric, for your question. I wonder if there's any other questions at all. Uh, let me just check. Um, okay, so Yara, some advice. Uh, my country does not emit huge amounts of greenhouse gases because it's a small non-industrial country. When I tell people about the climate strike, they might not relate because our country barely contributes to the issue. What do you think I can do to convince them? Of course, other than this is a global issue, we'll all be impacted by it sooner rather than later. I think this is a really good question because there's probably a few people on this call and um, taking part in the strikes who are gonna feel this way. Um, I've worked with, um, I wonder if you could tell me Yara, what, is, what country are you from? Is it Lebanon? Did you say it was Lebanon? Um, yeah, because I, I've, I've worked with countries in this, in this position when they, you know, um, I worked a lot with some countries in the Middle East on, on climate justice and energy. And, you know, they said to me, you know, like these kind of demands, they don't mean anything, you know, lowering our GHD, lowering our emissions, like keeping it in the ground. It doesn't really mean a lot to us because, the, you know, a lot of people in our country don't have enough energy, right? So when we talk about climate justice, it really is about energy justice as well. It's making sure that people have access to energy, 100% access to energy, but energy that is safe and energy that's resilient. So, so this is really a part of the narrative. So I think that maybe, maybe you need to sort of, maybe post this onto the Facebook group, I think. Um, I think certainly, yeah, the priorities might be, as Zoe said, the priorities for your communities might actually be the impacts, the, you know, the, the soaring temperatures. Um, it might be accessing energy. It might be that, you know, look, if we switch to renewables, to small scale, locally appropriate, climate resilient renewables which are community owned we're going to have energy sovereignty we're going to be resilient against the effects of climate change and everybody's going to have energy right so kind of putting forward sort of the other the the other kind of benefits of taking action on climate um, because i think that there are many there are many benefits to actually taking action it's not all about averting the apocalypse a lot of it's about transforming our society to the society that we need. So I don't know if that helps at all, but I think that maybe also if you, if you post this question, maybe in the Facebook group, um, there might be a lot of people who are in the same position as you, right? Who need to know how to convince people in your particular context. Uh, so people might have some more advice. Cool, thanks Yara. Okay, I think that we, don't have any time now for any more questions, but I wanna thank you all. It's been quite a small group, but you've all been really sort of participatory, really super engaged. So I wanna thank you very much. And I hope that we can continue some of these discussions in the Facebook group. Um, and if you haven't taken the other webinars, the other webinar topics, then do sign yourself up and I'll be really pleased to see you there. So thanks very much, everybody. See you all soon.